The decision of the Swiss National Bank to set a floor on the euro Swiss at 120 and the continued attempts of the Japanese to intervene in the strength of the yen are well reported. Yet they're not the only central banks to attempt currency intervention. Joining me today to talk about this is the Professor of Finance at the International University here in Geneva, Professor Frank Hollenbeck. Thank you very much for joining me, Frank. And I know you've got plenty of experience in currency FX forecasts and uh, these issues. So it's great to talk to you about that. So Frank, Switzerland, Japan, recently intervention from Poland, suspected intervention from India, and of course, continued intervention in the strengthening of the one from China. Is currency intervention becoming a more acceptable tool of policymakers and central banks, similar to the setting of interest rates, for example? Well, we've always had uh, central bank intervention uh, ever since the breakup of the international monetary system in 1971. Uh, what you have to understand is the current intervention we're seeing is primarily to stop currencies from appreciating. And uh, you have to understand something about uh, how currencies are set. Currencies are set basically as the differences in monetary growth between two regions and how the market anticipates will be the monetary growth in the future. So what's been happening is because of the lax monetary policy followed by the U.S. Central Bank and the uh, monetary policy followed in Europe with this threat that uh, the European Central Bank will monetize uh, some of this sovereign debt. So there's a big issue of whether the European Central Bank will be monetizing this debt. So it's having an impact on expected monetary growth in Europe into the future, this is causing uh, currencies such as the Swiss franc to uh, appreciate against the euro and currencies such as the, the uh, Japanese yen to appreciate against the US dollar. So the Swiss action earlier this year to set the floor on the euro Swiss at 120, some would say that was relatively successful, the floor of 120 is held. Then if we look at um, the Japanese action, they've intervened at several stages this year to stop their currency from appreciating. It's tended to work for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then the general trend of the currency continuing to appreciate has continued. Uh, why have the Japanese failed where the Swiss have managed to be successful? Well, I think a lot of it has, has to do with uh, market anticipations. Like I said, uh, currencies are determined by differences in monetary growth and the market's anticipation of what the differences in monetary growth will be. Japan has a history of wanting to control its money supply. And I think uh, a lot of people believe that uh, Japan recognizes that their currency will continue to appreciate against the US dollar. Now, for the Swiss franc, what they did is when it reached almost one to one, what they did is they basically set a floor, which Japan did not do. But by setting a floor, they basically changed market participants' perception of what the uh, euro Swiss franc rate should be. And the rate has actually gone above 120, which means that the Swiss central bank has not had to intervene okay, by uh, losing control of their money supply. Now, it all depends what happens in the future. If uh, the European Central Bank starts monetizing the debt, then it's very likely that uh, we will hit this floor of 120. And then the Swiss Central Bank will have to make a decision, whether it wants to keep the 120 or whether it wants to follow the monetary policy that the European Central Bank is following. Now, what the Swiss have shown is when it went from 150 basically down to one, is uh, they weren't willing to give up their control of their money supply. So my guess is that they would intervene for a while, but then when the cost became too large, they would ultimately let the uh, Swiss franc continue to appreciate. Okay, so let's move on to talk about China now. There is a bill still attempting to make its way through Congress over in America. The aim to force China to allow their currency to appreciate. Let's have a listen to what President Obama had to say at the Asia Pacific Summit uh, in Honolulu this week try to uh, set up rules that are universal, that everybody can follow, and then we play by those rules, and then we compete fiercely. So essentially, President Obama is saying there, we play by the rules and then we compete. China isn't playing by the rules. When countries across the world, as we've discussed, are intervening in currencies, and they have done for many years. Is it a bit of double standards of America to say that China aren't allowed to do that? First, let's talk about an appreciation of the yuan. What would it do? Um, Chinese exporters would have to raise their prices. So in other words, the average Joe who goes to Walmart would find all of a sudden he's paying 20% more for everything that he purchases. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that if the currency was to appreciate, it means 
means that China would not have to basically purchase dollars. And that means they wouldn't be purchasing U.S. Treasury bills. And therefore, um, U.S. interest rates would be higher and borrowing costs would be higher in the United States. Now, the gain would be to U.S. exporters. But what is what are exports to China? We have machinery. We have soybeans. And we have a lot of aircrafts that we sell to China. Now, uh, we would get a gain if we could basically reduce our prices and sell a lot more aircrafts. But I don't really think a lot of those products are price sensitive. So I, I don't really understand the U.S.'s strategy in this in the sense that I think they would be more pain than gain in forcing China to appreciate their currency. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for. But thank you very much for joining me. As always, Professor Hollenbeck, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.